Welcome and good afternoon, everybody. This is Stephanie Hall, and I am with the ESRD NCC National Coordinating Center. Thank you so much for joining us today for the um, ESRD National Coordinating Center Professional Education Webinar. As you know, these events are being held in partnership with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The series of events feature guest speakers from around the country sharing how they or their organizations they are with are coping with COVID-19. Before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that this call has been pre-recorded and will be posted to the NCC COVID webpage within three business days. However, we still want to hear from you. We encourage you to submit your questions via the chat or Q&A for the speaker. The NCC will email you within five business days with a response to your questions. Next slide. So just a little bit about the agenda today. We talked about what the call is about. Our speaker is Dr. Elizabeth Christofferson. She's the clinical director, solid organ uh, transplant psychology and kidney center psychology. Uh, she's topic today will be navigating the holidays during COVID-19 tips for professionals on how to celebrate safely and decrease stress. Next slide. So what's this call about? Um, we are doing these bi-monthly calls on different varying topics. We hear from different stakeholders and various peers in the ESRD community who are adapting to COVID-19. Um, they are also, they share examples and provide real world strategies for facilities to use. Next slide. So let me introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Elizabeth Christofferson is the Assistant Professor in the Departments of Psychiatry and Pediatrics at University of Colorado School of Medicine and a licensed clinical psychologist at Children's Hospital Colorado. She is the Clinical Director of Solid Organ Transplant Psychology and Kidney Center Psychology at Children's Hospital Colorado. Her clinical work focuses on patients with kidney transplant, end-stage renal disease and dialysis patients, heart and liver transplant patients, and their families. Her research focuses on adherence, health disparities, substance use, and risk and resilience factors related to health outcomes. I'm going to now turn the presentation over to Dr. Christofferson. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate being here to speak with you all and um, speak on this important topic. I know it's on all of our minds as healthcare professionals and, and it's on our patients' minds too. I hope to help everyone navigate decisions related to the holidays and decrease stress around this so you can celebrate safely. Next slide. Okay. And next slide. So we know there are many stressors that are really present already for everyone, and COVID-19 adds stress in the domains listed here. We all have potential stressors in terms of our physical health, mental health, family, social, school, work, lives, even prior to the pandemic. And of course, the pandemic adds to this. As healthcare providers, we juggle all of these on a daily basis, and COVID-19 has added immense, immense challenges to the workplace in an already stressful environment. While rewarding, we know that healthcare can always be a tiring career and that burnout rates were high among providers even prior to the pandemic. For our patients, we know that having a chronic illness adds significant components of stress that those without chronic illnesses do not experience. So, for example, the higher risk of infection for dialysis patients who are going into the center multiple times a week, the risk of complications is higher for those dialysis patients, patients with chronic kidney disease and transplant patients. And while some of our patients may feel kind of like they've been preparing for this and have always lived in this mode of heightened awareness regarding germs and illnesses, and professionals working with them may often live in that mode as well. For some patients, though, they've already at times practiced 
isolation, social distancing, even before the pandemic. And for professionals, we may even be more aware and concerned about the risks of COVID-19 because of this knowledge. Next slide. So we've been weathering this pandemic storm for a long time now, about eight months. We're all really just feeling tired of it. The stress about getting COVID, the isolations, restrictions, changes to daily life. It's been an election year. The stress of this has added up recently for people. People are really feeling the effects of loneliness, lack of connection to loved ones, you know, missing travel to see loved ones, missing spending time with others in a easier way. And the pandemic has really created a sense of collective trauma and grief in our society and really worldwide. What worldwide, the whole world is experiencing the trauma of this pandemic. You know, grief from those lost experiences and even death from COVID-19. And on top of all this, we now have the holidays. These are usually a time of joy, but can cause stress even during a non-pandemic year. We know that holidays add a stress of planning, organizing, presents, food, and we know family gatherings can always be a source of both stress and joy. This year, they're even more stressful in terms of how are we kind of figuring out, celebrating safely, and maybe having feelings of sadness about not having our typical holidays. So again, my goal today is to help reduce stress so we can enjoy the holidays, however we decide is really the best and most safe way to do so. Next slide. I really want to stress that the impact of the pandemic on mental health has been extremely concerning already, and we don't want holiday stress to worsen this. A Centers for Disease Control study found the following in terms of elevated mental health conditions. We know these are disproportionately worse among younger adults, racial and ethnic minorities, essential workers, which as healthcare providers we are, and unpaid caregivers. You can see the rates here that in late June, 40% of adults reported struggling with mental health or substance use. The prevalence of anxiety disorder symptoms was three times higher than during the second quarter of 2019. Depressive disorder was four times higher than in 2019. These are pretty profound rates. While considering the mental health impact of the pandemic, which is fueled by these changes, anxiety, and isolation, we also need to pay close attention to the physical health risks of the pandemic. And holiday decision-making is about weighing the different risks carefully. Next slide. So, we're aware of these high rates of burnout among healthcare professionals. At this time especially, these rates are increased from the usual burnout rates. Burnout and trauma are even more prevalent due to the following demands and stressors at work for healthcare providers. So we know there's a physical and psychological strain during long shift hours and being an essential worker during this pandemic not being able to stay home like some other working professionals who aren't essential workers. Um, Childcare or virtual learning for your kids is an additional stressor and managing and figuring out the different pieces of this. And the strain of wearing all the PPE, mask, shield, whatever PPE is necessary can impact our ability to really hydrate enough and eat enough during the day to fuel our bodies, and it adds kind of a barrier between us and patients, which we know, you know, are very ne necessary barriers that also can be challenging. There are unprecedented hospitalization levels and severity of illness, which you likely feel on any unit in the hospital, whether it's the ICU or not. There's the additional stress of concern for transmission of the virus from the workplace learning about exposures in the hospital, I know has been a stressful aspect for many of us, caring for COVID-19 patients, and our constant hypervigilance that we might bring home to our loved ones. There's also the grief and trauma associated with concern for our patients, COVID-19 patient illness, death, 
family or friend illnesses or deaths due to COVID-19. And we know that 40 to 50% of physicians and nurses are currently experiencing burnout, and these rates may continue to climb. We also know that women, nurses, and those frontline healthcare workers are really at risk for these high rates of depression, anxiety, insomnia, and distress. Next slide. So for yourself and your patients, it's really important that you know your own risk level based on your health and the appropriate guidelines for this. As we know, people over 65 and those with the conditions listed here are at higher risk for severe illness and complications due to COVID. This is based on evidence already collected and determined throughout the pandemic. And there are additional conditions that might also be higher risk, so evidence is still being gathered. And this list of conditions that I have here kind of keeps growing pretty quickly. So how do we navigate some of these risks and really try to stay safe? Next slide. So I know you're all very aware of these basic precautions. These are just the things we want to ensure we keep doing and reiterating to our patients, our family and friends. We know there are things we can do to mitigate anxiety regarding health risks and to lessen the impact of risks on our mental and physical health and well-being. So first, let's discuss some of those basic tips. These will help you feel more in control and reduce anxiety by ensuring you're following those basic precautions and have what you need to be safe, whether in relation to the holidays or in your daily life these days. So again, basic hygiene for illnesses, you know, hand washing, staying home if you're sick, covering coughs or sneezes, um, staying six feet away from people who aren't in your own household, um, making sure that you're wearing those masks or face coverings in public, cleaning dirty surfaces, those high-touch surfaces frequently, monitoring any symptoms, and even wearing eye protection in public has been shown to reduce COVID-19 risks. Next slide. So for patients, for our patients who have chronic kidney disease, these are some things we can remind them to do at this time. They should continue their medical treatments, including dialysis and medications. We want to encourage patients to keep food on hand to follow their diet, um, especially that emergency kidney diet plan, which uh, patients can find online, and maintain any fluid or diet restrictions they have. Patients should follow social distancing guidelines, of course, and just like all of us, being six feet apart from others or more. Encourage patients to talk to you and their healthcare team if they become sick or if someone at their house becomes sick. And patients and those at high risk should stay home as much as they can and avoid crowded places. You know, condense grocery and errand trips out in public, keep prescriptions on hand, if they can get a 90-day supply, that's preferable, or get medications delivered to their home, and they can look into other delivery services, too. Next slide. So we know that there are current concerns based on the current rise in infections of COVID-19 during this sort of third peak or spike. And Dr. Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, has really encouraged people to think very carefully about how they spend the holidays to avoid even more increased rates of COVID-19. We know the winter, winter forces us more indoors and indoor gatherings contribute to the transmission of COVID-19. And overall, people at increased risk should avoid in-person gatherings with people who don't live in their house and should avoid larger gatherings and consider lower risk activities instead. So really the following guidelines should be taken while considering that, especially if you fall in that high risk category, you may need to be even more careful. Weighing those risks and benefits is important for you and for any counseling you're giving to your patients. Next slide. 
again, overall, these decisions related to COVID-19 in terms of activities are about weighing risks and benefits. You have, you know, the potential health risk to yourself, and this should take a large priority. And then there are also public health guidance, guidelines and risks, and you need to consider any guidelines or state and local orders that are in place. You'll need to also think about, of course, your mental health. If your mental health is suffering from lack of social connection, how can you engage in that social connection safely? And what risks are really worthwhile? What are you comfortable with? What's most important to you in the context of these risks? And above all else, anyone at higher risk and our patients should really consult their healthcare team with specific questions. Please know that any guidance from this presentation is informational in nature rather than medical advice. Each person may have different aspects of their health to weigh with their healthcare team. We know that the safest and lowest risk option is always to stay at home and avoid gatherings. However, if you do plan a holiday celebration, here are some tools to help determine risks and options. Next slide. So I'd like to walk through kind of risk assessment and decision-making tools with steps that can help you determine whether an event feels safe to you. So the first step is assessing the rates of COVID-19 in your community and the community you're considering an event in and where those people at the event are from. You can really find helpful tools and rates on the CDC website and the local area public health department website to kind of determine what those rates of COVID-19 are. Next, you can assess the location of the gathering and the length of time of the gathering. So we know that indoor is higher risk due to poor ventilation and transmission risks. Open windows and doors are better, but outdoor is really best. The longer the duration of the event, the higher the risk than a shorter event. Step three, assess the number of people who are gathering. Of course, more people is higher risk. And keep in mind people, including yourself, who are in that high-risk category. In some states and area, there are currently regulations on the number of households that can gather. For example, here in Denver, Colorado, it's, um, you know, really encouraged to limit interactions outside of your own household at this point. Can you safely physically distance with the number of people that are gathered at the gathering? Next slide. So next, think about where attendees are coming from. Mixing people from multiple places is not recommended, especially if some high area, some areas have really high um, rates of COVID-19. In terms of the type of travel, there are varying levels of risk associated with all types of travel and lodging, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Next, think about what activities those attendees have engaged in prior to the gathering. Can people agree to quarantine before the gathering for one to two weeks, or is that not possible? Do the people who are attending tend to follow those, those basic precautions during their daily life, like mask wearing? And think about the behavior during the gathering. Are you all able to engage in mask wearing, social distancing, and not sharing food? Next slide. So a bit more on the risks of various types of travel. Of course, there are varying risks, but you can take certain precautions if you are traveling. For plane travel, you'd really want to try to avoid public transit to and from the airport. Stay away from crowds in the airport. Sanitize everything at your seat, and of course, keep your mask on during the flight. For driving, you want to make sure to sanitize when you touch any public service surfaces at any stop. Try to pack your food and drinks so you don't have to stop as much. Make sure your car is running well and ready for the drive. For staying at hotels or vacation rent rentals, you'll want to know that the safety protocols they're using are sufficient. 
keep the windows open initially to air it out and clean high touch surfaces upon arrival. If staying with family and friends, you'll want to think about getting tested or them getting tested. Make sure you're comfortable with the precautions they're taking before you get come together. If you can quarantine and they can quarantine, that's best. But it could be safer to stay in a hotel if all parties aren't able to quarantine before the trip. Next slide. So, of course, during a celebration or travel, make sure to follow basic precautions if you do decide to gather or travel. And in addition to those basic COVID-19 precautions, you'll want to encourage people to bring their own food and drinks and avoid serving potluck or buffet-style food. Make sure anyone who's sick doesn't come and limit contact with commonly touched surfaces and wash hands very frequently. Next slide. I wanted to review some examples of potential Thanksgiving or holiday lower risk activities. So having a small dinner with people in your house, preparing meals and delivering them without contact, having a virtual dinner with loved ones, shopping online, watching parades from home or sports events from home, these are all lower risk activities. Next slide. Some examples of what we would think of as a moderate risk. Having a small outdoor dinner with people in your community, make sure you follow the CDC recommendations online for hosting an outdoor gathering outside. Visiting an outdoor place where that there are precautions, like a pumpkin patch or an apple orchard, where people are using hand sanitizer, wearing masks, and maintain social distancing. Or attending a small outdoor sports event with safety precautions and distancing in place. Those are all moderate risk. Next slide. Some examples of higher risk activities so going shopping in the stores when they're very crowded, such as just before, or on, or after Thanksgiving. Being at a crowded sports event or, or a parade. Attending um, any crowded events where you can't distance. Using substances like alcohol, these can cloud judgment and reduce inhibitions, and that can increase risk-taking behaviors and help us or make it easier to forget those distancing guidelines. Attending large indoor gatherings with people from outside of your household is a higher risk activity and traveling. Those risks kind of vary based on the type, but can be higher risk. Next slide. So I'd like to give some basic tips and tools for decision making. These apply to deciding how to basically celebrate the holidays for you, but also apply to any other weighty decisions in your life. One idea is writing a pro and con list. This can be really helpful since writing helps us process information. Seeing and reviewing the pros and cons can be helpful to make a decision. Some factors may count more on your pro and con list than others. Another tip is to pretend you've decided on how you want to celebrate the holidays and sleep on it or sit with it for a few days. Notice how you feel, relieved or anxious, or some of both, which could be normal as well. Are you feeling regretful and wishing, wishing you decided differently? That may be a good guide. You can also gather information from your specific healthcare team, trusted family and friends, and those involved in those potential celebrations. Discuss with them how to celebrate safely and what they think. And know that you can change your mind at any point, even close to the time of the celebration. Everyone understands that this fear is very different. Next slide. So upon deciding your plan, it's helpful to kind of know that you may have thoughts and feelings that might arise once you've decided that plan. Knowing there are many considerations, it's important to think about how to cope with the plan you determine 
knowing that anxiety may linger even after determining that plan and during the event too. Write a list of concerns and how you will address them. Write down your plan. Talk through your plan with loved ones who are involved. Next slide. And in terms of tips for informing your loved ones about your decision, it's important to respect others' opinions and decisions, even if they differ from yours. Base your decisions on really what you're comfortable with. While you can ask others to follow certain rules or precautions, you can only truly control your own behavior. So knowing this helps you make a decision. Be transparent about your expectations for any potential gathering, your comfort level, and any risks involved. Allow others to make an informed decision too based on this. Shift the conversation if you're not comfortable with what your family and friends want to do for the celebration and focus on moving forward with them by redirecting the conversation on what you can do together. Don't engage in arguments with people with other views. You don't want to compromise on your physical and emotional safety and you may not be able to change their opinion. But it's great to have a script for yourself. How are you going to inform others of your decision, especially if you're not able to participate in their event? These are some good examples here. So I've decided that this is the best decision to keep me and others safe is an example. I'd like to see you, but I don't feel safe at this time traveling. Um, this does not feel like a good time to celebrate as a group. I would hate if anyone got sick. I hope we can celebrate together next year when this is all over. I'd love to be part of the dinner still. Would I still be able to FaceTime with you? And while we may have to be physically distant now, that doesn't mean we have to be emotionally distant. Be direct and honest. Be firm so there's no room for guilt or follow-up questions. Next slide. It's really a great time to Kind of be creative and resilient in our holiday planning. Let's take this opportunity to enjoy some new activities, start new traditions, or modify older ones that we have. And take time for self-care and relaxation. Take some pressure off those holiday gatherings. For example, you can still have a virtual dinner. Maybe you make the same dish all together but separately in your household and eat it together virtually, or you open presents together virtually. You could have each family member, including older kids, participate in cooking, making a new dish, or divvy up that cooking of your holiday classics. You can start new traditions with activities that are new and exciting and feel more safe, like watching a new movie that will become your holiday tradition movie, go on a family winter walk somewhere new, with hot chocolate, get a new board game, and play that on the holidays. Enjoy the benefits of the smaller gathering. This means less prep, less mess, less cleanup, and less stress. And you can also look at old photos and videos from past holiday celebrations and reminisce about, about those and get excited for the next time you can all be together. Next slide. After a celebration, it is important to anticipate we may have emotions around the holidays. That's true any year, but even more so with the pandemic. You may experience anxiety if you did engage in some risk taking. You might have disappointment on the other hand if you didn't get to do your normal, normal holiday activities. Those feelings are all normal. It's important to acknowledge them, talk about them, and then engage in coping strategies to move forward. Thinking ahead to these emotions, which feels more acceptable to you? Would you rather experience some of that anxiety around risk taking or potential disappointment of being more cautious? We can also still have gratitude, which we know is protective and beneficial for our mental health based on whatever celebration we were able to engage in. Also engage in mindfulness about your holidays. Notice what you missed and what you actually maybe ended up enjoying more about this new way of celebrating. So maybe you missed seeing all your family and friends together, but maybe you felt less stressed overall. You can take these on to your next 
celebration when things are easier to celebrate with everyone. Next slide. So this is also a reminder, we need to continue to engage in all the important coping strategies that are always helpful for us and are even more helpful during the pandemic and the holiday stress. Overall, one way to reduce anxiety is monitoring your media use and your screen time. News can be both important to stay informed and also a source of stress and anxiety. If it's causing you stress, limit your news and media consumption and your screen time. You can limit to 30 day minutes or less per day. Turn off news alerts on your devices. Make sure you utilize trustworthy news and medical sources. Monitor your screen time. We know it's likely increased currently. Some activities may make you feel good and connected to others, and some might cause anxiety. Between Zoom, video calls with family and friends, virtual work meetings, virtual learning, social media, and news, which make you feel good. Some of these might be necessary at this time, but you can really set some boundaries around them. This is also an important time to establish and maintain daily routines despite routine being disrupted. This means consistent sleep and wake schedule, exposure to daylight in the morning, and overall exercise and stress management. These can increase our immunity and regulate our circadian rhythm. So work on getting your eight hours of sleep, discontinue electronics at least an hour before bed, Make sure your bedroom promotes sleep, so quiet, dark, cool, and relaxing. Monitor caffeine and alcohol and your diet. And even just getting dressed in the morning is a cue for you that it's time to start the day. Despite gyms being closed or not being somewhere you feel comfortable being, there are many ways to continue to engage in exercise, either indoors at home or outdoors if practiced in a safe, socially distanced manner. There are free apps with trainer-led workouts. And it's important for you to also take breaks between meetings or sitting times. Our bodies need these bio breaks. Next slide. We know that Stress and anxiety create tension both in our minds and bodies. When we're stressed, we tend to have tense muscles. When we're in that fight or flight mode, we tend to tense up. Utilize relaxation exercises to help reduce tension in the mind and the body. So deep breathing, guided imagery, progressive muscle relaxation, these are mindfulness-based stress reduction techniques. They're evidence-based and scientifically shown to reduce stress, anxiety, and depression symptoms. You might feel like they're a little bit hokey or not sure if you'd be into them, but I really encourage you to try these practices if you haven't yet. This is the perfect time to do it. We could all benefit from this during the time of COVID-19. Many apps that help with these techniques that are listed here are free currently and are really helpful as a way to guide the practices. Even just basic deep breathing can be helpful. You can also do simple mindfulness exercises like taking a walk, exercising, or other forms of relaxation and self-care, like watching a movie, cooking, cleaning can be healing for some people, doing arts and crafts, and other soothing activities. You can just take advantage of your alone time to refocus and calm yourself as well. We also know keeping our hands busy with tasks can actually reduce anxiety through distraction, behavioral activation, and active coping. So some activities that are soothing to some people include cooking, drawing, art, knitting, doing puzzles, painting nails, writing lists, journaling, I know a lot of people have been buying jigsaw puzzles lately and doing that during their free time. Continue to connect with friends and family virtually or in a safe way. Keep in mind, even those virtual social connections like Zoom or FaceTime, they can feel tiring at times since they're not the same as in-person interactions. And don't judge yourself for that. Be mindful of whether 
you're isolating or withdrawing socially and be creative in how you can engage with people. You can utilize different forms of technology or older methods of communication. So whether you use video calls, text, phone calls, writing letters, or physically distanced outdoor social connection. Next slide. I want to highlight some additional tools, too. So positive psychology refers to the presence of positive psychological resources. Examples are having positive affect in your face, having life satisfaction, and overall happiness. We can work to increase these. Some different ways that are helpful. So gratitude, three good things is an app. It's a, it's a practice that has scientific evidence. Every day for seven days, you write down or record in the app three good things that happened that day and your role in bringing them about. This has shown to increase happiness and decrease depression symptoms, and it has an impact even after that first week of completing the exercise. Another strategy is doing random acts of kindness. We know this actually promotes well-being in the person doing the act of kindness even more than the receiver. You can practice giving back to your community and being a helper which promote well-being in yourself. And in terms of clarifying your values and living those out, the goal is defining your core values and really trying to embrace them within your work life, your relationships, your leisure time. The best is when those values overlap across these domains. This is protective against burnout. And we know that resilience is like a muscle. It's not fixed. It can grow stronger over time. We can all grow in our knowledge about ourselves and each other and learn from this difficult time during the pandemic. Next slide. I'd also like to review this helpful model for coping presented by Russ Harris, author of The Happiness Trap, called Face COVID, and this acronym has these different steps listed here, which I'll review. First is focus on what's in your control. You can't control what happens in the future, what happens with COVID-19, the economy, what other people do, when the vaccines are ready, or your thoughts and feelings around fear and anxiety. Those are inevitable to have those fears and anxiety but you can control your actions here and now, and you can control how you respond to that fear or anxiety. A, acknowledge your thoughts and feelings. Notice what's going on, what you're feeling and thinking, such as I'm having thoughts about getting sick or I'm having feelings of loneliness. Then come back into your body. Connect with your body. For example, slowly press Press your feet into the floor, stretch your arms slowly, do some deep breathing, get out of your head and into your body. E is for engaging in what you're doing. This means a focus on the here and now. Refocus your attention to the activity at hand. A good way to do this is to notice five things you can see, five things you can hear, Five things you can touch, taste, and smell in the moment. Give your full attention to this practice and what you're doing. C is for committed action. This means implementing effective action that's guided by your core values while following the guidelines of the pandemic. So ask yourself, what can I do right now that improves life for myself, those in my community, or my friends and family? And O means opening up, make room for those difficult feelings and be kind to yourself. Acknowledge the fear, anxiety, sadness, and loneliness that we're feeling. We can't stop these feelings, but we can make room for them and normalize them. Treat yourself kindly. What can you say to yourself and what kind of things can you do for yourself in these moments? 
these values refer to your core values that guide your committed action from the C step above. What do you want to stand for in this crisis? What sort of person do you want to be? What sort of healthcare provider do you want to be? Examples of these values include respect, patience, caring, love, courage, compassion. Sprinkle your values into your day. And ensure that they guide your actions. I identify resources. Gather your resources for help, assistance, support, and advice. We'll discuss these resources, such as mental health and emergency hotlines, that can be helpful for all of us. Finally, disinfect and distance. Disinfect everything, use hand sanitizer, wash your hands, and practice physical distancing. Remind yourself what you're already doing to remain healthy and to care for your patients, how you already have skills to maintain your health and prevent infection. Remember to use these various coping skills throughout the holiday season, however you plan to celebrate. Next slide. And please know that if symptoms of stress, anxiety, trauma, or depression are concerning to you, it's important to seek help. You can always talk with colleagues and trusted friends or family but it's often helpful to have an objective outside perspective to talk to without concern for you making them upset or that they might have a biased perspective. So it can be truly objective. You can seek a therapist through your insurance, your health insurance, or your employee assistance program or EAP. You can look on Psychology Today or the American Psychological Association for evidence-based therapists in your region or who are doing virtual therapy. There are many local trauma response teams that also can be support. And there may be hospital resources through your organization, sort of available for psychological first aid. This has become a really important component of the pandemic, and it's great that hospital organizations are acknowledging this. Some have implemented peer counselors or support groups for staff and providers within the university or healthcare association or hospital. And meetings with hospital leadership where you can raise concerns, share information, and discuss the status of COVID-19 at your organization are helpful. Next slide. Finally, there are many helpful online resources. The Healthcare Toolbox uses a trauma-informed perspective and has specific COVID-19 resources, tips, and tools. The American Psychological Association also has a lot of self-care self advice for healthcare providers during COVID-19. And the National Alliance on Mental Illness is another organization with evidence-based tips as well as listings for these organizations listed here that offer therapy to healthcare providers. You can look into all of these organizations for counseling, often free or low cost, and either virtually or locally in your area. Next slide. And thank you so much. It was really a pleasure to speak on this topic to you all, and I'd love to open it up for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Christofferson. That was a great presentation and a lot of uh, good tips for dealing with the holiday season during the COVID pandemic. So thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, we do have some questions we'll get into here, so we'll just jump right in. So um, first question here says, uh, I am worried about putting my patients at risk if I travel or attend a gathering out of state, though I know other colleagues of mine are doing this. Is there a best practice for a dialysis unit to adopt so we can each, uh, we can keep each other and there are patients safe? That's a great question. I know a lot of us are, are thinking about, about this topic. So, of course, it's important to follow any public health orders 
um, and guidelines for your area. In terms of holiday travel or gatherings, keeping groups small is always better. Um, washing your hands, ensuring social distancing. You can look into your hospital rules on whether there's a quarantine period after any travel, especially if it's out of state, um, or state and local public health rules and orders. Uh, are there any restrictions on travel in your state or local area? And this is something we're all thinking about, I know. Um, here in Denver, we have recently had a, a spike that, you know, has come about very quickly. We've gone to sort of level three on our barometer, which is high risk, um, just before that stay at home level. And we've been told not to socialize or gather with those outside of our household um, and have a 10 p.m. curfew in effect now. This really makes the holidays even more difficult. Um, of course, you know that these are guidelines and, and for the holidays you can sort of um, have what interactions you deem safe, but I know in light of this, my husband and I have decided recently that we're not gonna be able to travel out of state to see our families for Thanksgiving just to reduce possible transmission, knowing there are some high-risk family members that we have to think about. Um, and we've decided to use Zoom and sharing of recipes and cooking and eating together virtually to celebrate and really relax at home instead, which um, has some benefits, of course. And we hope that, you know, everyone who works in healthcare can just be diligent and careful about thinking about what they're gonna be doing for the holidays. So. Um, definitely a good thing to look into whether there are any specific orders or regulations or restrictions from your dialysis center. That's great. Thank you. I, I know that conversation is going on on my household, too, on how to celebrate the holidays this year. So, you know. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Another question for you. Are larger family gatherings safe if everybody gets a test before the gathering? if there is travel involved? Yeah, this is another really um, common question and it gets a little bit tricky with testing. So, you know, we know that quarantining advance in advance is really the best option um, if all parties can quarantine. And we know that larger family gatherings are risky regardless. We know we're we're trying to have smaller gatherings um, within a family. Testing is really just a snapshot of time. It doesn't reflect potential transmission that isn't quite showing up yet on the test or that happens soon after that testing. So that makes it hard. It, it may give you some sense of reassurance, but it could be some false security. Um, so you want to really try to follow all the other good guidelines and precautions. Um, if driving is, is the travel that you're doing and you can avoid any contact during, for example, that might help if you know you're not engaging with anyone else. But again, it's um, tricky with the timing of those tests. Right, right, right. Thank you. Uh, so another question here, can I host my high-risk parents knowing that my kids have been in school? Yeah, and if kids are in school in person, um, which I know a lot of them are, you know, we would hope that they're wearing masks. Um, of course, it's it's kind of best to take minimal risks for those individuals who are higher risk, at higher health risk, like like your parents, like you mentioned. And if you can keep kids out of school in person. Um, for a couple weeks prior to the gathering and have them do virtual learning instead and kind of quarantine, that's the best way and that would be preferable. Um, if you can't do that, you know, you'd hope that the school is taking good precautions and the kids and teachers are wearing masks, but maybe you still say, okay, we'll try to stay outside um, if we can with the weather and we'll wear masks 
and our parents will wear masks. And we can also limit the amount of time of the gathering and have a shorter gathering, but maybe still see each other in person with those precautions. And those are helpful if you can't do a full quarantine. Um, with the weather getting colder, you know, outdoor celebrations are becoming more difficult. And you may have to be careful about uh, what kind of ventilation you have if you are inside. Okay, great, thank you. That's uh, good to know. And let's see, we'll move on to uh, next question. How do I remain excited about the holidays when it feels stressful to make these decisions and I feel sad about the idea of missing my family for the holidays? I know we're all grappling with this, and it, it is sad, especially if it's been a long time since we've seen family um, and friends, and I know I'm, I'm certainly feeling that, too. Um, it, it really is about those risks and benefits. So if there's a way to safely see your family and it's worth it due to that mental health boost that that brings, that is important to think about. Would you be able to kind of see them during maybe a more off weekend, maybe a weekend that's not as busy if there's travel involved, um, or a smaller gathering with not, you know, the whole family holiday gathering. That could be more safe. Um, if you're not able to gather with your family, again, try to look for ways you can still celebrate within your small family unit who you live with, um, and, and maybe virtually with those people that are further away or that it's not safe to gather all to, together with, you know, you can still be with them virtually um, through video calls, um, texts, and phone calls during the holidays. And you can sort of look at this um, year, the holidays, as kind of a novelty. If you typically travel or have family travel to you for holidays, this might be one of the only times you celebrate without that travel as a smaller family unit. I know my husband and I have thought about that, that this might be really one of the, the only times that, um, you know, we're celebrating as a smaller family unit. And you can enjoy that and kind of create some new traditions and, um, and the novelty of it for, for this year while getting excited about you know, when things are more safe, going back to those those larger gatherings. Definitely. Um, I think we have time for one more. I've got uh, the question says, uh, I have a family member that I believe is depressed due, due to the mm -hmm. pandemic. What can I do to help her? Yeah, that's really um, something that we're noticing in friends, family, colleagues, and that is so important and I want to commend you for just picking up on that and for noticing that they're struggling. It's it's so important for us to watch out for each other during this time and to reach out to friends and family who are struggling um, and to kind of notice the signs which you may have seen, you know, withdrawal or um, mood being down a lot and depressed or maybe, you know, family member not engaging in their typical routine or exercise or eating less or more than usual, sleeping less or more than usual. All those things can kind of be signs and symptoms of depression. And so noticing it is the first step. And then talking to them about it, um, you know, it's it's good to acknowledge that hey, I've noticed, you know, you're not um, doing your workout classes or every time I talk to you, you just seem really sad and, you know, I want to hear how you're doing. Even simply just asking people, how are you doing? Um, and really not letting them off the hook with the standard, like, I'm, I'm fine, how are you? Um, it's important to kind of ask more about what they're doing to take care of themselves and really how their mood is and how they've been feeling. You can also kind of open up about yourself and that might help too. So acknowledging anything you've been struggling with, like I know it's been hard at this time to miss friends and family and I wonder how you're feeling about that. Um, in addition to checking in with them, 
you might think about, um, you know, offering to check in frequently, setting up check-in calls with them, but also seeing if they're open to professional support and counseling, especially if you're, you're pretty concerned. Uh, that might be something that they're open to, and hopefully if they are, then, you know, you could even help them find some resources for virtual or in-person therapy, um, and that is really helpful. You can also point them to some of those um, online resources that um, I shared that have either counseling or just kind of self care um, and, and stress management tips. Um, know that it might be even helpful to check in with them about their safety. Um, have you had any thoughts about hurting yourself or wanting to die, making sure they're not suicidal, um, and making sure they have a plan in place if they are, including someone they can reach out to, um, a crisis hotline, national suicide hotline. Um, you know, it's, it's something that sometimes feels a little touchy and tough to go there, but it's important to ask, and we know that um, asking actually is preventative against, um, you know, worsening depression or even something like suicide. So really important to um, just take care of each other during this time and really be there for one another and and notice like you did any depression and, and help people with that. Right, yeah. Yep, it's a tough time. So thank you so, so much Absolutely. again. And I think we've come to almost the end, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up. If I could have the next slide. So I just wanted to let everybody know that the NCC has some inspirational posters on our website. Uh, if you visit the website listed below, the esrdncc.org slash professionals backslash inspirational hyphen posters. We have a couple of different ones there that you'd be able to, are in PDF format that you can print. Uh, there's some on um, psychological and physical health, emergency preparedness, and COVID-19. Next slide. We also do want to remind you about our Kidney Hub. It's a kidney uh, mobile-friendly tool tip, tip tool that was created with patients for patients. It links to new videos and helpful resources. So, again, if you could visit www.thekidneyhub.org today, we have information on home dialysis, COVID-19, and transplant. Next slide. And just as a reminder, our next COVID-19 webinar event, the patient-focused event, is December 1st at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. The next pro provider-focused event will be December 9th at 3 p.m. Uh, those are all posted on our website, and you can go ahead and visit kidneycovidinfocenter.com to register. Next slide. And just again, thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day to join us. And as a reminder, the slide deck and the recording of this presentation will be posted to our website in about three business days. Um, so you can visit it there. There was a lot of resources that Dr. Christofferson had in her slide deck toward the end. So if you're interested in learning about more of those, uh, those will be in this, included in the slide deck. And again, will be posted within three days to our website. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to have you on a future webinar.